So previous before America literally joins the war, FDR, who is definitely not an isolationist, he pushes for this thing called the Lend-Lease Act, which gets passed in March of 1941. You know, Hitler had already been Chancellor of Germany since 1933 and invaded Poland in 1939. So World War II had already been waged for two years without any American intervention. Why? Why didn't America help out? What was the majority opinion for most of, of most Americans? It wasn't our fight. Yeah, not our fight. We are isolated, isolationism. But FDR knows better. And so he does this thing called the Lend-Lease Act, which is passed in March of 1941, which allows the United States to lease war supplies, we're just giving it to them basically, um, to any nation that, de you know, that was deemed vital to the defense of the United States. So he uses a, a national security cloak in order to help. Who's this ultimately helping? Yeah, which ally in particular? Great Britain. They're the only one that hadn't fallen yet. You know, France was already occupied. And so you can see that Uncle Sam here is doing everything he can, short of war, to, to help Great Britain. But ultimately, what brings, what, what is like, what is the thing that changes in America? What happens that goes from America not being involved to let's go kick some butt? Pearl Harbor. Yeah, the attack on Pearl Harbor. On December 7th, 1941, a day that will live in infamy, according to Franklin Roosevelt, more than 180 Japanese warplanes launched from six aircraft carriers attacked the United States Naval Fleet in Pearl Harbor, Hawaii. And for an hour and a half, these Japanese planes, which were, you know, surprise attacking the Americans who were just waking up on a Sunday morning, um, blasted target after target after target. And the devastation on the American fleet was, was appalling. This attack was the single greatest day of, the single, the day with the single greatest loss of life of Americans up until September 11th, where 2,403 Americans were killed and more than 1,100 more were wounded. 21 ships were sunk, including the USS West Virginia. Nearly the entire Pacific Fleet I don't know if you guys know anything about the Pacific Ocean, but it's pretty big. And nearly our entire Pacific fleet was located there. The losses the United States sustained at Pearl Harbor in that, si in that hour and a half were greater than the United States suffered in the entirety of World War I. Pretty bad, pretty bad. So it was just by luck that three aircraft carriers escaped to sea and their survival would definitely prove crucial to the outcome of the war. So the Japanese are literally, they attacked us. We have been attacked. Granted, 95% of Americans could not find Hawaii on a map Never even heard of it. It wasn't a state. It was just some territory that we got. But in Washington, D.C., the reaction to this attack ranged everywhere from outrage and anger to panic. What are we going to do? So um, each report that kept coming in was more terrible than the last. And... 
because everybody knew what this meant. What did it mean? Yeah. Not only are we joining a war, who are we joining a war against? Japan. It's not even where we've been fight, like where we've been helping people out. Where have we been helping people out? Europe. So not only are we going to be fighting a war, we're going to be fighting a war on two fronts. And traditionally that's not a good thing historically. Okay? So this will this is a monumental day, as Franklin Roosevelt describes in his address when he asks Congress to declare war on the Japanese. He calls it a day which will live in infamy when the Japanese attacked the United States unprovoked and asks Congress for a declaration of war, which they grant. The United States declares war on Japan, and then three days later, Germany and Italy declare war on the United States. One of Hitler's greatest mistakes, he didn't have to do that. It's really the only, we are the only nation he declared war on in World War II. Everywhere else he just attacked. He's not like, hey, France, I'm coming to get you, and then go. He's like, no, we're just going to roll up in France. The United States is the only nation he declared war on, and didn't have to. Big mistake. So for all the damage that was done at Pearl Harbor, uh, perhaps the greatest damage was done to that of isolationism. Many Americans who had been formerly isolationists now supported an all-out American war effort after the surprise attack. Many outspoken isolationists prior to the attack were now spouting out in Congress about how let's go lick them and using even worse profanity than that in the houses of Congress to describe what they're going to do to those evil Japanese. All right, so, and the Japanese was like, after this, they're like, man, those Americans are weak, they're weak-minded, they're soft, and they're just going to fold up like a cheap card table after this. We literally destroyed their entire Navy, basically. They're weak. So the expectation of the Japanese is that Americans would shrink from conflict, that they would be like, oh, the Japanese, oh. They don't really know Americans very well. So the day uh, after the raid in a Japanese newspaper, it like was published that um, the United States was reduced to a third-rate power, and uh, they were tre and the, the United States was trembling in her shoes. That's what was published in the Tokyo, or the Japan Times. But uh, if Americans were trembling, it was not with fear, but it was with rage. So they were un greatly underestimated the Americans' resolve when being attacked. And after Pearl Harbor, eager young Americans jammed recruiting offices, saying, Let's, I want to be a hero. Let's go get it. Or people that were just simply having trouble in school, they didn't like school, joined up. And five million men volunteered for military service after Pearl Harbor. Five million. Still wasn't enough. We still had the selective services. What was the selective services that was created out of World War I? The draft. And the Selective Service expanded and eventually provided another 10 million soldiers. That's 15 million soldiers. Did we lose our tanks and ships? We lost a significant portion of our Navy, mm -hmm. the Pacific Fleet. Right? So we got two, two sides. All right. Um, so you begin to see a, a massive propaganda campaign to support the, the, the efforts in World War II. So you see things like, you've you all seen this young lady right here, right? Who's that? Rosie the Riveter. What is her, what is the propaganda she's wanting to spread? Why is that necessary that women need to go work? That's right. 
We just sent 15 million young men who are no longer in the workforce. Women are going to have to step up and do their jobs for them. And they do a fantastic job. And businesses could not wanted to hire women. Not only could women do the job of men, but these businesses paid women 60% less. Ouch. So, but, but women definitely stepped up. And then when the war was over, they were promptly asked to return to their homes. Uh, what about this middle one here? Of course I can. I'm patriotic as can be, and ration points won't worry me. There was this thing that the United States uh, introduced. Well, it didn't introduce. They brought it back after World War I called rationing. Only certain days of the week could you get certain goods. So you can see what she's doing. She's making her own goods. She's canning her own stuff so that she doesn't have to do without. She's not worried. She's going to, and that's what it's encouraging women to do. I like this one. When you ride alone, you ride with Hitler. Join a car sharing club today. What's the what's the aim here? Why? Save gasoline. Save gasoline. You know, gas. A gallon you don't use is a gallon in a in a tank or a gallon in a truck. So that's um, that's the, the aim of that one. Um, you also see some propaganda against the Japanese, and the Japanese propaganda is highly racist. They, they, they did not really ever paint the German people as animals, but Japanese propaganda is absolutely, like, horrible. Like, as far they, they want to paint the, 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 the Japanese as almost like animals. So um, you see this one. Go ahead, please take day off. You know, jabbing at the the, the, the facial features and the in the way they speak. Why do they want? Why is, why do we have a Japanese soldier asking Americans to please take a day off? That's right. Which people are they aiming this at? Like Karen said, the factory workers. If you're not if you're not in the factory producing guns and planes and tanks and bombs then you are aiding in the war effort for the enemy. So please, go like they want, are asking people to go to work. Tokyo kids say, much waste of material make so happy. They want you to waste, want you to be wasteful. Um, this is one that aimed at like, keeping your mouth shut because a lot of, this is more of war hysteria than anything, that there were spies amongst our midst and um, they would you know, basically just keeping keeping your mouth shut, uh, don't spread rumors, um, things of that nature. And they even had an entire branch of uh, propagandists aimed at just soldiers. And the biggest thing for the soldiers was, uh, well, being a, a little bit more um, moral like not visiting prostitutes. Look at all the tons of propaganda. Um, talking about syphilis and gonorrhea as a booby trap. That's funny. Uh, four out of five pickups have venereal disease. They're, that, they're, what they're saying here is that, <laughs> what is that, 80% of women have venereal disease. I don't, the facts may be a little off, but what's the what's the aim at this? Distraction. Huh? Distract? Well, yeah, I'm sure men needed a distraction, but what's the aim of the military in creating this propaganda? Keep it in your pants, fellas. You know, you, we don't want you sick. A sick soldier is not fighting. Okay, and these diseases, syphilis and gonorrhea, were pretty pretty common. Okay, pretty common. They're common today. So um, that was a big effort to try to keep, keep these men doing what they should be doing. Okay. All right, so where are we at now? All right, so now we have to rebuild. We got to rebuild quick. Like, we just lost the majority of our Pacific fleet. We got to start producing stuff. And that is, when America joins the war, that is... The, our, the secret weapon of the Allies, number one. 
is the American industrial economy. We can produce stuff greater than any other country in the world at that time. So, um, you know, as we mentioned, after Pearl Harbor, a lot of ships were destroyed, and it was not looking very promising for the Americans to be able to rebuild it quickly. And President Roosevelt asks for 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 uh, American businesses and organizations to step up and begin to make dramatic contributions into the the war effort. So uh, it's really a, a production miracle, a production miracle. As almost every industry in the United States, every factory turned whatever it was they were making and shifted into making war materials, like automobiles. Cars were not made during World War II. If you, like, if you, get, if you get an automobile that was made in 1942, that thing's worth about $80 trillion because they only made like five. What were they making? Trucks and Jeeps and airplanes and stuff like that, right? war materials. You, you didn't go buy a brand new 1942 Ford, okay? They just didn't exist. And the ones that did exist were bare bones because the majority of the metal and the materials were needed for the war effort. And as I mentioned, other industries retooled their factories to produce tanks, planes, boats, jeeps, things of that nature. Um, you know, like there was this one company that made mechanical, or they made pencils. They made they made pencils, and they retooled their factory to make parts for bombs. They went from making pencils to bomb parts. Um, one f textile mill that made br bed spreads started making mosquito nets. For the, for the troops in uh, the Pacific front. Uh, a soft drink company started, instead of filling bottles with pop, they started filling shells with explosives. Like they just retooled their factories, Every, like everything. Now that definitely changes life for a lot of Americans because a lot of the commodities that you're used to being able to get a hold of are no longer being produced. So it, it does show that the war is going to affect every American in some way, form, in some in some fashion, okay? So, but as a result of this, shipyards and plants and factories were turning out stuff at a dizzying speed, a speed that had never been seen before. Um, they were like, there was this one shipyard in California that was producing a whole ship in four days, four days, a whole ship. So literally before, um, you know, within a couple months, everything that was destroyed at Pearl Harbor, it's not only been replaced, but replaced with brand new, and then they're still producing. So we are able, the, the, this is an absolute incredible, incredible effort made by our, 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 our factories. And it's not only the industry themselves, but also they needed labor. Laborers had to step up as well. And more than 18 million laborers were working in war industries. Six million of those new workers were women. And as I mentioned, those, those, those women were, were in high demand. At first, factory owners were, were weary of hiring women. They feared they lacked stamina for factory work. But once women could prove that they could do the welding, that they could do, operate a riveting gun the same as a man, employers could not hire enough of them because they were much cheaper to hire. So, um, not to mention like minorities getting jobs, you begin to see great migrations from the south to these northern manufacturing plants again. And, and, and along with them came all the social problems, along with that with mixing races. Uh, but it's a total, our entire society mobilizes, okay? And another mobilization that occurs is in science. Science mobilizes as well. In 1941, President Roosevelt created the Office of Scientific Research and Development, OSRD, in an effort to bring science to the war effort. And the OSRD spurred all kinds of innovations and improvements 
in things like radar and sonar. You guys know what radar and sonar are? It's like it uses invisible invisible waves, wavelengths, to determine the location of items near you. And it has all kinds of practical like they can that's what police officers use for their for their speed speed guns, radar, because it bounces back information. Um and you know, in applying this to war, this would be extremely helpful for submarines because you could tell what's around you because you can't really see out. In the, it's not like you can just look through the windshield and see what's ahead of you because it's dark. Okay, um, so radar and sonar are very important for for uh, so, uh, locating and navigating underwater. Uh, the the OSRD um, encouraged the use of pesticides like DDT. You ever heard of DDT? What does DDT do? Well, it's a pesticide. What does any pesticide do? Kills yeah, it kills insects. So as a result, United States soldiers were probably the first soldiers in the history of soldiers to be free from body lice. No body lice. Um, you ever heard of DEET? You ever off? You know, by the off, it's got DEET in it. There you go. All right. Not the most healthy thing for you, but... Neither's malaria, so um, the OSA, OSRD also pushed for the development of miracle drugs like penicillin, which saved countless lives not only on the battlefield but off it as well. Penicillin, super super awesome antibiotic. You know, you get a get a wound, and you get gangrene, gangrene, you die. Well, penicillin can help pre prevent infection and cure. Inf fight infection once you're sick. So um, the most, obviously though, the most significant achievement of the OSRD was the secret development of a new weapon. Yeah. And the OSRD began to engage in experiments by, about splitting uranium atoms. Splitting atoms. Because splitting an atom generates an enormous amount of energy. Even a guy by the name of Albert Einstein gets in on it. He writes a letter to President Roosevelt, really warning him that the Germans could use this information to create a weapon of enormous destructive power. Einstein was Jewish, so he's not a big fan of the Germans. So... Roosevelt responded by creating an advisory committee on uranium, and they began to do work in a nationwide project. What was that project called? The Manhattan Project. And it literally is nationwide. Do you know why it's called the Manhattan Project? Because it has absolutely nothing to do with Manhattan. It's a total secret project. They're making nuclear weapons. They even did stuff in Morgantown. How about that? It is, but it is literally a nationwide effort. So the committee believed that it would, in 1941, believed they would need three to five years to develop the technology to create a successful atomic weapon. So... Um, a lot of the early research was done at Columbia University, which is in Manhattan, so I guess it's not entirely nothing to do with Manhattan. But that became the code name for the research project nationwide, Manhattan Project. Okay? Okay, so... America is drawn into the war, and we are going to join the Allied forces. There's all, we already have an ally in place in Great Britain, and their leader is Winston Churchill. And Winston Churchill came to the White House the same month after Pearl Harbor. On December 22nd, around Christmas time, 1941, Churchill shows up at the White House and spends three weeks with President Roosevelt in, as his guest. They, are, they themselves really make the plan for how the war is going to be conducted. 
Both believed that Germany and Italy posed a greater threat than Japan. And Winston Churchill convinced Roosevelt to strike first against Hitler. And once the Allies had an upper hand in Europe, then they together could turn their forces toward the Pacific. And these two men had a, forged a great relationship with one another, in fact, becoming good friends and forging a deep affection for each other. So um, they, yeah, there's all, they have lots of correspondence with one another and saying things like, it's been a lot of fun to live in the same decade as you, because you know, they, they, contempt- they were friends. All right, so America starts out in the Atlantic, okay, in the Atlantic. And after the attack on Pearl Harbor, Hitler goes to the old German go-to of unrestricted submarine warfare using German U-boats. And he ordered submarine raids along the shipping line, submarine raids along the shipping lines along the America's east coast. And the German aim of this was to prevent food and war materials from getting to Great Britain. So Britain depended upon those, those shipping lanes. And this 3,000 mile long shipping lane from North America to Great Britain was their lifeline. And Hitler knew that if he cut that lifeline, Britain could be starved. So uh, in the first four months of after Germany declares war on America, Germany sank 87 ships like a mile or two off the coast of America. Yeah, yeah, sure. Okay, so America and Great Britain have to overcome that, and then they they do the convoy system again and are able to overcome it. So we said, what was the Allies' secret weapon number one? America's ability to produce. Okay, because ultimately the war becomes a war of attrition, just like World War I. You know what the secret weapon number two is? Yeah, the Russian army, the Red Army. Russia has more deaths than almost the entire rest of the world combined. Sorry, I got to put this in the fridge. Yeah, no problem. So the Germans had been fighting the Soviet Union since nineteen, since June of nineteen forty-one, but in November. As, as it does throughout the Soviet Union, it gets very cold. And that bitter cold stopped the German army in their tracks just outside of Moscow at another, in another city called Leningrad. If you recall, there's a 1,600-mile front between, between the German and the Soviet Union's lines. And, and so in the summer, when summer came, the Germans took offensive again and began to hope to capture Soviet oil fields in the Caucasus Mountains in places like the Baltic, like where war is being threatened, oh, I don't know, today. Um, So, but Hitler wanted to capture those oil fields. He also wanted to wipe out Stalingrad. Stalingrad, you ever heard of Stalingrad? He didn't want to wipe it out because it was a particularly important military side. You know why he wanted to knock it out and just do, and conquer it? Because it's named after Joseph Stalin. That's the only reason. Just because he wanted to embarrass the communists. So Germanly or Germanly, Germany confidently approached Stalingrad in August. And a furious Stalin, who was still kind of in shock, was like, what's this Hitler guy doing? I thought we signed this pact. He's an idiot. And a furious Stalin orders, orders the, the Red Army to defend Stalingrad no matter what the cost. 
no matter what the cost. So for weeks, the Germans pressed in on Stalin Stalingrad. And they actually ended up controlling about nine-tenths of the city. And so they had a successful summer and fall. Nine, 90% of Stalingrad belonged to them. But what happens after summer and fall? Winter. Another winter sets in. And the Soviets saw this cold as an opportunity to roll Frank's fresh tanks in across the frozen landscape and begin a massive counterattack. So the Soviet army closes in around their own city of Stalingrad, trapping the Germans in and cutting off their supplies. So the German situation in Stalingrad was hopeless. And the fighting continued in Stalingrad all throughout the frozen wasteland of winter. And the Germans knew there was no hope whatsoever and ultimately ended up surrendering. And hundreds of thousands of German soldiers are lost in a pointless effort. Pointless. In defending Stalingrad, one city, the Soviets lost 1.1 million troops. 1.1 million troops. Just so you know, that's like three times what America lost during the entire war. The Red Army lost 1.1 million troops in one battle, the Battle of Stalingrad. The Soviet victory does mark a turning point in the war. And from that point on, the Soviet army would begin a westward march toward, toward Germany. Along on that west, westward march was the Battle of Kursk. Kursk. The Battle of Kursk is the largest tank battle in the history of war. And it's Germany versus the Soviet Union. Panzer tanks, German tanks, versus the Red Army's Russian tanks. Which also proves to be a victory for the Soviet Union and another turning point. That is how the Soviet Union and the Red Army is a secret weapon. They're like a bulwark. They absorb all the, the major blows. They do the majority of the, the harm to the German war machine. Yeah, America has got all the war supplies and Britain and French, you know, all the allies. Without the Soviet Union, it's a completely different story. All right. Okay, so all while the Battle of Stalingrad's going on, Stalin was like, hey, America, when are you going to open up another front against the Germans? Because right now they're focusing all on me. All right? And so he argued, Stalin, that an invasion across the English Channel would force Hitler to take troops away from the Soviet Union and divert them westward thereby splitting Hitler's forces in half and making it easier to kind of pinch in on them. And Churchill and Roosevelt disagree. They don't think that the Allies had enough troops to attempt a European invasion, an invasion on European soil. So they launch a, their own operation called Operation Torch. And Operation Torch invades North Africa. So the command of all Allied forces was given to an American general named Dwight D. Eisenhower. So he was the commander of everybody. Didn't matter, England, French, whatever. He's the Allied commander. Okay? And American troops begin to land in Axis-controlled territory the German-controlled, Italian-controlled North Africa. See the red lines there going to places like Casablanca, Algeria. 
and American troops and British troops begin to land there and slowly take land back from the Axis powers and return it to the you know, allied, allied control all the way to Egypt, all the way to Egypt. So all of North Africa is re reclaimed. And it takes about 107,000 troops. The majority of them are Americans. And after heavy, like all of these battles are, are bloody, and a lot of these troops are green, not really been in battle much. But they are successful, eventually. So after North Africa... What do they do? Just stay in North Africa? Where do they go next? The Allied forces. Anybody know? Nobody knows where they go next? Italy in what is known as the Italian campaign. Italy is one of the bad guys, right? I mean, if you look at the map, it's pretty logical. North Africa, taken back. Sicily's not far away from Tunisia, just a little, just, a, just right across the uh, Mediterranean. So the next logical step is to go to Italy. And they, they knew that this was the next step even before the Battle of North Africa was won. So uh, the Italian campaign got off to a good start with the capture of Sicily. Sicily's the island off the tip of the boot that Italy's kicking, you know. And it got off to a good start in the summer of 1943, which the forces there were stunned. And the, the Italian government forced the dictator of Italy, what's his name? Mussolini. Benito Mussolini, to resign. And so Mussolini has to resign. Italy's government falls apart and is no longer an enemy because the government of Italy becomes a democracy. Mussolini escapes and becomes a guest of Adolf Hitler. But Hitler is determined to stop the Allies in Italy and sends lots of German soldiers to the Italian peninsula. And one of the hardest battles the Allies encounter in, in the entire European conflict was fought in um, a small European or Italian town called Anzio. Anzio, about 40 miles from Rome. Anzio. This battle lasted for four months it was expected to last about three days. But the German resistance and the German reinforcement proved very difficult for the Allies to overcome. But ultimately, the Allies are successful and victorious after Anzio. And the effort to free Italy ultimately does not succeed until 1945 when Germany gives up. So it's the Italian campaign lasts the entire war, basically. All right, so all of, you know, I'm skipping around, skipping around. Ultimately, though, what does the United, what does the, what do the Allies ultimately have to do? Yeah, they're they're, they're in they're in North Africa, they're in Italy, but where's the where are the main places that have to be liberated? Yeah, Germany's got to you got to get to Germany, but before you can get to Germany, you got to go to go through France. How do you get to France? Literally, physically, how do you get there? Okay, yeah. If you're if you're an American troop or a British troop, you're in England, and to get to get to France, you must cross the British Channel, the English Channel, and so an invasion has to be planned. That's amphibious. You know what amphibious means? It's water, water and land, and then also from the air. And the largest ever gathering 
the, of an invasion force ever mounted in human history occurs in June of 1944, a day that we now refer to as D-Day. Under Eisenhower's direction in England, the Allies gathered a force of nearly 3 million troops from America, Britain, and Canada. Okay. These 3 million troops, along with literal mountains of military equipment and supplies, plan an attack in northern France in an area today called Normandy. Well, it was called Normandy then. It was called Normandy for the last thousand years. Normandy. And these plans were completely kept secret. There was, there was espionage involved. There was trickery. America's greatest general, one of America's greatest generals in the Italian and North African campaign was General Patton. You ever heard of him? General George Patton. He was sent with great fanfare to like someplace as bait because they, the Germans had spies and the Germans were watching the movements of American troops. They, like Eisenhower sends Patton and just has him sit in some place with a bunch of like inflatable tanks, like these huge inflatable tanks so that when German spy planes would go overhead, they'd look down and see these, this huge army knowing that Patton is there. And so that like the, the Germans would be like, okay, so this is the closest point. This is where the invasion is going to come from. And Patton was just a decoy, total decoy. And all these like literally like inflatable tanks. There's pictures of like one Allied soldier like holding a tank up like this because it's, it's like just an inflatable pull toy. And there was thousands of them. So is in an effort to trick the Germans into where the Allies were going to invade. All the while, the Allies planned to invade in Normandy, which is in northern France. So in doing that trick, it kind of splits Hitler's forces. Not able to put all the forces in Normandy. He splits them all across the, the, the line in France. So um, the Allied invasion codenamed Operation Overlord, it's D-Day, was originally set for June the 5th, but bad weather forced a delay. But then the next day on June 6th, 1944, General Eisenhower gives the go-ahead. And shortly after midnight, three divisions parachuted behind enemy lines. Imagine it being in the middle of the night and you're jumping out of an airplane while people are shooting at you and you have to jump out of an airplane. And then when you land, you're behind enemy lines. Those guys got paid an extra 20 bucks a month. Yeah, they were airborne, airborne troops. Um, so the, th the three divisions parachuted down and it was massive, you know, just a big mess. Just a big mess because they were missing their, missing their drops separated from their, from each other. And then early the next morning, a massive seaborne invasion began. And it became, became the largest land, sea, air operation in Army history. People were yelling, screaming, dying, running on the beach. Equipment was flying everywhere. Body parts were flying everywhere. Men were bleeding to death, crawling, lying around, fire coming from all directions, trying to find cover behind anything. One guy said, if, one guy said I, I dropped behind a, a rock the size of a golf ball in hopes of getting cover. Because you're literally on the beach, and you, you just, you're in this boat, and the flap drops down, and then there's people shooting machine guns at you. And you have to run across the beach and go kill them. It's not an easy thing to do, okay? And it didn't go exactly to plan. You know, they dropped all those guys in behind them, the parachute guys, the night before in hopes that they could, you know, kind of catch them in a crossfire. But that didn't go exactly as to plan because the drops were off. And, you know, imagine trying to fly an airplane in the middle of the night and people shooting at you, guns and stuff. So 
Um, overall, though, the, the invasion at Omaha Beach and and uh, Gold and Juno and Sword and Utah, all the invasions are successful. Not not without a great amount of you know, loss of life, but they were successful. Okay, so. Despite the heavy casualties on the Allied beachheads, uh, Allies held an 80-mile wide strip of France. So France was slowly becoming liberated. So um, within a month, the Allies had landed a million troops, 567,000 tons of supplies, 170,000 vehicles, massive invasion force, massive invasion force. Uh, General Omar Bradley unleashed a massive air and land bombardment against the enemy in battles like San Lo, which is S-T, Saint, Lo, L-O, and uh, which provided a gap through which General Patton could then, could then come and, and bring his third army. Uh, so literally, it's just, it's slow moving. But ultimately, the Allies gain ground every day. Every day, they're gaining ground, gaining ground, gaining ground. Until October of 1944. All right? In October of 1944, Americans captured their first German town. Americans are now in Germany. It was called Aachen. A-A-C-H-E-N, Aachen. And Hitler panics. Because he knows it's, it's, it's over, basically, by, by this day. And he responds with a desperate, last gasp offensive. And he orders his troops to break through the Allied lines, push back out of Germany and into Belgium with a last gasp blitzkrieg back into the Allied forces. This bold move, he hoped, would disrupt Allied supply lines and demoralize the Allies, and it does. And so on December 16th of that year, German forces broke through the weak American defenses along an 80-mile front and split the American forces in half, creating a bulge in the line that the Americans had, cre had, had, had created. This line was down through this, on this thing called the Siegfried Line. After Germany did this last gas offensive, a bulge, do you see the bulge? A bulge emerged in the line. Hence this, why this is called the Battle of the Bulge. So tanks drove into Allied territories, German tanks, creating a bulge in the lines in this last ditch effort, which gives it its name, the Battle of the Bulge. And as Germans swept westward, they captured American GIs, SS troopers herded prisoner into large fields and didn't take them as captors, just shot them. So um, the Battle of the Bulge raged on for about a month. When it was over, the Germans retreated back beyond the Siegfried line. And little seemed to have changed other than an, a month-long horrific battle in, in the woods. But events did take a decisive turn after the Battle of the Bulge because of the major losses that the Germans sustained. 120,000 troops, 600 tanks, 1,600 planes. And these are losses which they could no longer sustain. So from that point on, after the Battle of the Bulge, Hitler and the Nazis could do very little but retreat. And we'll talk about that retreat tomorrow.